You know what they say, don't read the comments. Well, I read the comments. Welcome to another edition of Scarlet's Don't Read the Comments. Today, I'm going to feature some of my favorite comments on a recent video of mine. But first, to thank everybody who has liked, subscribed, commented, and done all the YouTube stuff, a few kitty pics. The first pick is Carson in her nest, her airy, if you will, where she can overlook the garden and the whole world as far as she's concerned. The second is Susie Q doing yoga with me. She often likes to do that hobby with me. And another picture of Susie Q just looking curious, suspicious. There you go. Your thanks for liking, commenting, and all of that kind of stuff. I really do appreciate everybody's support of my little channel. All right, let's get ready, set, and go. So the video I'm taking these comments from was my seven more sincere questions for atheists videos, which got a lot of interesting answers that I wanted to feature today. But before we get to the commenters on my channel, I would like to read a comment that was on Michael Brown's page. He has comments open if you want to go bip over to that page and put a comment in that he will also ignore. So let's see what that commenter said. Dear Dr. Brown, now that you've asked your honest questions for atheists and got at least a few honest and substantive answers, I'd like to ask you a question. When and where do you plan to publicly address, process, and respond to the answers you've got? I ask this because for several decades I've heard many, many Christians publicly asking questions of atheists and never showing any sign that they've ever seen or heard any answers from anyone. The attention-grabbing headlines are either umpteen honest and sincere questions for atheists or umpteen important questions atheists can never ever answer. Number five will rock your world. I know for a fact that many atheists have indeed been answering those questions for about as long as Christians have been asking them, and yet none of those oh-so-sincere questioners have ever shown any sign of hearing any of the answers. In fact, you're the only questioner I've yet seen who even provides a space for us to post our answers. Which is why I'm coming here to ask you, what is your response to our answers now that you've actually got them? I eagerly await your response. Thank you. So that was from Raging Bee back on July 10th. And guess what? No answer. Now, it is true that most of these Christians don't answer these questions. The exception is that guy over at Trinity Radio what's his face, who made a bunch of long videos responding to some atheists. So, you know, fair play to him and all. He answered to the best of his ability and he didn't change his mind, but you know, he answered. So, uh, yeah, we would like to see some response or acknowledgement. I think one of the things that bothers me about these kinds of things is you ask the question, you, the Christian asks a question pretending like this is oh so sincere. And it's like none of the Christians actually look at them they just keep asking the same questions. And it's like they've never seen, like, oh, nobody's answered these questions. It's just blinders on, I guess. All right, so that was on Brown's page. Let's go look at some what some people put on my page. Clem Stevenson wrote, it's essentially an effort to shift the burden of proof that has been dressed up as a series of, quote, honest questions. There is no evidence to imply that I was sent here on any kind of mission and the concept of spiritual missions is not even limited to Judeo-Christianity. I do think this is a fair point from Clem. This shifting of the burden of proof is something common that theists have. Instead of setting up proof for what they believe, they like to shift it over and say, well, why do you believe what you believe? And if you don't convince me that I'm good in my position, basically, which there you go. So these questions, I, I actually think of them as evangelizing or maybe not even evangelizing, keeping butts in pews, keeping the Christians thinking that there is an outsider out there that is awful and evil. And, you know, we have all the answers and they don't. So it's kind of my thought, but I do think that this is a fair point. Let's go on to the next thing. John Burns, 8031, wins the prize for the most succinct answers. Uh, I like this technique of just saying yes, no, whatever I want. I think it can. Just the minimum of explanations because Really, when, I, when it comes down to it, the questions are based on some kind of prior understanding of the world, some default state of the world, and I'm not sure that they're meant to get at any kind of real dialogue. 
So why bother with all of the long explanations and flourishes on your why and how and all of that kind of stuff? Because, you know, if you've answered these questions once, you've answered them a million times. And is the person actually listening? Well, I think we know the answer to that. Let's move on to some other answers. The next comment is from Josh Reidinger, 3407. And the part of the comment I'm specifically interested in is number four, do you believe that science can provide answers to the remaining mysteries? So Josh says, yeah, probably. This doesn't seem like a question that's particular to atheists, though. Yeah, fair point there. Presumably theists think God is behind everything in some sense, even things we have physical explanations for, like rocks or the wind or dogs having puppies or people falling in love. God doesn't really serve any explanatory purpose precisely because God could explain anything. So even if we found out how the Big Bang happened in exacting and minute detail, it would just be irrelevant to the question of whether God exists, right? And that is absolutely right. Religion can always say, well, that's just God using the laws of physics to do whatever, God using evolution to do whatever. It really is only, I think, the fundies who believe in young earth that this is, doesn't apply to. But that's not the majority of Christians. The majority of Christians uh, trust science, uh, look at what science says for a, a wide range of things. And even young earth creationists use technology and presumably go to the doctor and things like that. So yeah, the theists also think that science can provide answers. Yeah, awesome. Next one. So the user Philetra or Philetra, I'm not sure which way you prefer that to be pronounced left lots of comments and was answering uh, themselves. So this one, it regards, are you 100% sure there's no such being as God? Uh, and I like this beginning. So the more you define God, the lower the likelihood I place on something matching your definition existing. And I agree with that. The more things you put onto the God, I think, the harder it is to believe that this God actually exists. Eternal, all-powerful, and all-knowing, to the extent that all three of those qualities are not really well defined, I am 100% sure that nothing which exists has all three of those qualities. I'm not even sure the second two are even possible because I do not know what all powerful and all knowing can mean, nor that the two can exist side by side. If you know the future, can you change it? If not, then are you all powerful? If so, are you all knowing? Really, I get the impression that the collection of omni qualities attributed to the Christian God is more a response to my God can beat up your God. So yeah, um, I, I really love this comment. And I think that this is uh, absolutely true. Uh, recently, I read something about this all knowing bit do is God all knowing and it, it was a very complicated thing about the Trinity where the God the Father knows what it's like to be God the Father and God the Son knows what it like what it's like to be crucify, but God the Father doesn't. It was a very strange and weird, and it led to more questions and mysteries than it actually answered. So I'm not even sure Christians know what they're saying when they say this. I don't, I, am, I agree. I don't know what all of these things mean, and I'm not even sure about why God needs to be eternal. Anyway, good points here. Let's move on to the next commenter. Daryl Leelam 256 starts off with, ow, these questions. <laughs> I like that. I also like the little image for Daryl in here. But the comment I really was interested in was the following. This comment is specifically about, would you follow God, Jesus, whatever, if you had evidence, secure evidence that this being existed? And so he writes, the God of the Bible is a self-centered monster. And if he cares about humans at all, it's as toys to play with. Think of the story of Abraham and Isaac. God tells Abraham to kill Isaac to prove his loyalty. We'll skip past all that this all-knowing God needed to have someone prove their loyalty because that God should already know the answer. But the real problem for me is that Abraham didn't question it. He didn't even object to it. He was just going to kill his own son. Christians will say that God stopped him, but honestly, that just proves me point. God was toying with them, and it's Abraham and Isaac that suffer from that. Abraham has to live with the fact that he really was going to murder his own son for such an arbitrary reason as a loyalty test, and Isaac has to live with the fact that his father will not hesitate to kill him. Now, I doubt that either Abraham or Isaac even existed, but it shows this God's character, and it's not good. This God cares nothing about his toys, and they seem to exist for no other reason than to satisfy his ego. Yeah, uh, great points there. Some of the things that I've thought too. By the way, by the way, if you want to see a, a funny skit, look up Mitchell and Webb, Isaac and Abraham, and I uh, 
it is a delightful skit. It came out maybe 14 years ago, the show that Mitchell and Webb look, I think it was, uh, was on a while back, but they have some really great religious skits. And, you know, think about Job, too. I mean, that is the ultimate God is toying with uh, his creation because Satan says, hey, I bet you can't, I bet Job will stop being loyal to you. And it's just a bet they have, you know. So uh, the God of the Old Testament isn't that much different from the Greek gods or some other pantheons of gods that existed, you know, just messing around with, uh, the, granted, this god created uh, humans, supposedly, according to this mythology, whereas, you know, Zeus and company at Al and all that, uh, they weren't creator gods. They were subject to the, to the fates just as much as humans were, but they were more powerful. But, you know, this isn't that much different from those kinds of gods. All right, let's move on. Aldebaran4154 is the next commenter, and this is the comment that I was interested that they wrote. On number three, does God exist? Not at all. The universe is a great place because it exists. It's like Douglas Adams' story about the garden and enjoying it for what it is without adding fairies to make it seem better. I'll tell you, you just have to mention Douglas Adams in a comment to get my attention. I always loved his stuff, and I agree that you, you don't have to have a God to stand in awe of the universe or just our world even. There are all kinds of amazing things. You don't need anything behind that to enjoy it. I love looking, for example, right now as I record this, it's winter in the Northern Hemisphere and Orion comes up at the sky and I like watching Orion's uh, procession across the night sky where Orion starts in the evening and soon Orion's going to be pretty high up in the sky and then eventually will not be in view anymore. And I just love going out there and seeing you know, where is Mars tonight, all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, I love this quote. There's another one from this commenter that we're going to go to now. Are you materialistic? Yes and no. I've never been a go after money person, but I am a collector of things. We have one life to live, so go after and collect things that bring happiness into your life. In the spiritual meaning, it'd be absolutely. So yeah, um, I agree. Go out and collect things. Enjoy this world. One of the things I like about this comment, and these are going to be our last comments for this comments video, is the world is enough as it is. This life is enough. With all of its imperfections, with all of the strange, weird, horrifying, beautiful, all of the things that happens, it's interesting and it's all worth looking at. And find things that bring you happiness and joy in the here and now because ultimately that's all you know that you have. That's going to wrap up this comments video. I hope you liked it. Uh, like, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff. You're on YouTube. You know what to do. I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.